Instructions for accessing subtitles in a language other than English are included on our board meeting's webpage as well as in the description below. Instrucciones para acceder a los subtítulos en un idioma que no sea el inglés se incluyen en nuestra página web de reuniones de la junta, así como en la descripción a continuación. All right, good evening and welcome to the Ross Valley School District Board of Trustees regular meeting. Today is March 27th, 2024, and I am calling our meeting to order at 5.02. Uh, we have three trustees present at the moment at the Ross Valley School District office at 100 Shaw Drive in San Anselmo. Um, myself, Rachel Litwack, Chris Landles cobb and Daniel Cassidy, Ryan O'Neill, um, and Shelley Hamilton are not here yet. Um, we also have cabinet members present, um, Marcy Trahan, CBO Chris Carson, and Teresa Machado. And our meeting is being live streamed via YouTube, and the link is on our website and on the agenda. Uh, there will be a 60-second delay between the meeting and the YouTube live stream, and an audio recording of the meeting will be made available to the public on our district website within 72 hours of the meeting. So... Now that we've called it to order, we're going to move on to our agenda item B, which is closed session. Um, I'm going to identify the items of our closed session. Uh, the first is consideration of purchase offer of real property pursuant to government code section 54956.8, conference with legal counsel, anticipated lit litigation, significant exposure to litigation pursuant to government code 54956.9, subdivision D2 or 3, Special Education Program Dispute, one case, student SSID number 43099232216, and conference with labor negotiators pursuant to government code section 54957.6, all employee groups, CSEA, RVTA, confidential classified, classified management, and certificated management. And with that, uh, we move on to item two of our agenda, public comment regarding items on closed session agenda. I have one comment. Um, card from the public. Uh, Aaron Billman, if you'd like to come up and take a seat and if, make sure your thing is up towards the top. Okay. <laughs> Hi, yes, Aaron Billman. I live on Porteous Ave in Deer Park, so I'm a neighbor of the Children's Center, and I just wanted to come here to voice support for the um, closed item that is the hearing the purchase offer um, for the Deer Park property. Um, I'm not an expert in this space, so um, please bear with me if any of my comments are not fully informed, but from my layperson vantage point, this seems like it's a win-win-win solution um, in that it both enables the Children's Center to stay in operations, it releases the school district from its liability, and it provides additional revenue that can hope you can hopefully um, use for other pressing purposes. I don't know if it could go toward the salary negotiations, for instance, of the teachers, but um, hopefully, you know, um, that helps too. And so I just wanted to um, say thank you for hearing the purchase offer. I hope that um, there's a positive outcome. And on behalf of the Deer Park neighborhood, we've got a lot of, my daughter was a Ross Valley School District student. She's now at Archie Williams. We're, we're taxpayers. Um, we're supporters of having the Children's Center as our neighbor. And um, just super grateful that it looks like there might be a solution that works for everyone. So thanks, thank you. Thank you. And no additional public comment? <laughs> All right, so with that, um, we will move into closed session at 5.05. Thank you for coming today. All right, good evening, and welcome to our Ross Valley School Board trustee regular meeting on March 27th. Um, we are um, coming out, re reconvening out of closed session at 642, and there is nothing to report out this time. There will be a continuation of closed session at the end of our meeting, um, but for now, we are going to move on with our agenda. We are going to item C, procedural items, um, and we will begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. So if you would like to stand and say the pledge with us, please feel free. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, and now we are going to adopt the agenda and time allocations for our meeting tonight. Somebody like to make a motion? Second? Do we have a second? 
second. All right. Motion and a second. So Ryan? Aye. Daniel? Aye. Chris? Aye. Shelley? Aye. And Rachel? Aye. So we have an agenda. And moving on, we have something I'm very excited about tonight. We have a student presentation tonight from the Wade Thomas School. And I um, believe we have our transitional kindergarten students here tonight, Mercy? Yes, we do. From Wade Thomas School. We're so excited to have you here tonight. TKers, where are you? Raise your hand. Are you excited to be here and speak to the board about your program? Well, we are so glad you are here, and we are even more thrilled that you brought your teacher. Where is she? <laughs> Miss Ladresh. There she is, Miss Ladresh. And I think you brought your principal. Miss Harris. There she is. And then I think if you turn around, you see some, you'll have to stand up, those of you in the back way, Thomas, other teachers and staff. Do you recognize those people? Have you seen them at school? All right, so there's so many people here tonight who are so excited. And then I think you also brought your parents, your guardians, and maybe some brothers or sisters. Did they? Yeah, all right. So we are so excited. This is one of the highlights of every one of the board meetings is when we have a spotlight on one of our schools. And we're so thrilled to hear from you all tonight to talk about transitional kindergarten. It's been a program that is expanding and the purpose of it and the goals of TK are changing. And you all are part of that history to see the change in action. So we're so thrilled. And Ms. Harris, are you gonna? Yeah, we're yes. okay. all start we're together, start. and we also have Miss Daniels with us, too, who's our oh, chief. Oh, excellent. We miss Daniel, Daniel, not Miss Daniels. Daniels. Okay, thank you, Jojo. <laughs> Jojo will always <laughs> make sure I say it right. Uh -huh. That's right, Miss Daniel. No X on the end. She's our transitional kindergarten instructional aide, and we're so happy to have her with us. So just to get started, we just wanted to say that we at Wade Thomas and probably all of us in Ross Valley School District really believe in the whole child. And that's all the elements here, physical, social, emotional, sensory, cognitive, and communication, every child, every day. So everyone gets a fresh start, a clean slate, a new lens every single day. And I think that's really important with the work that we're doing with our transitional kindergartners and all of our students. And Ms. Ladrush and I have been working very closely together to help them transition this beautiful year into a whole new paradigm. And she's gonna talk for the rest of this presentation, <laughs> along with our wonderful kids. So I have an extensive background in kindergarten. And when I initially started teaching TK, it was 14 to 15 per class, and they were older. And so I did a lot of desk teaching, um, seat work, teacher directed, and not as much open-ended play-based learning. Um, but now I've made a shift because our demographics have shifted. And so I started kind of here, and now we're in this area where the classroom is rich in child initiated play and also with guided learning with rich experimental activities for the kids. <laughs> <laughs> so this is my old classroom. Um, it was one big room. It just felt like one big room with desks, centers pushed off to the side, which were more close-ended because they were like games and things, not so much where they're using their imagination. Um, it felt a little too open in a way, and it felt chaotic, I think, for the kids. It, it felt noisy and, and overwhelming a bit because there were no nooks or crannies that they could go off and you know get quiet in or investigate. So this is the next one. Do you want to talk about who you work with? Um, okay. Yeah. So this is my new classroom, newly designed, um, and I did a lot of work with many people. Um, there is the, our TK consultant, um, Betsy Fox, from the um, Merced County Office of Education. I'm in the TK network with Joyce Slater. I worked with um, a TK team throughout the district. Um, and I took extensive classes in early childhood development. And then um, we were given a grant, a TK grant, 
and I was able to, well, actually, um, Julia Wolfat shared also a whole checklist that um, Betsy Fox created to, for a thriving TK classroom. So I kind of used that as a guideline and did a lot of great research for um, educational toys, um, proper furniture, things to create more, more like open spaces, spaces that were designated for learning. So they, they now have all the tools they need. They have costumes. They can really um, like jump in and really learn and, and take it where they want it to go. So it's open-ended now. Um, and it's embracing the play-based learning, which is more developmentally appropriate for their age. The kids are going to talk, and our kids, who are curious, adventurous, imaginative, playful, and tactile learners, are going to come up and be speakers. So the first one is Luke, I think. Yep, yeah, there you go. Okay, you want to come up? Yeah. Tell us about that picture. Uh, 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 tell us Okay, so he was saying that he made an airport, and he was the pilot, and Bodhi was, um, I think he was the foreman, wasn't he? And they, they constructed it together. Good job. Nice. Three different gateways, he said, right there. Yeah. What the, where do they land, Luca? Oh, <laughs> uh, so that's what the little thing is. That's what the little thing is. Uh, yeah, wow. Oh, they fly into there and then yeah. they hop up and then walk in. So, like, it goes off the blocks and then they go inside one of those and then they go inside. Yeah. Oh, I want Is it block play so much fun? Yeah. Oh, don't you? Let's see what else you're going to tell us about. <laughs> talking about the sand tray. He was watching them make patterns, and he loves to make patterns with these little balls that have triangles and different shapes on them, and you can fold it. Yeah. Triangles and Yeah. Thank you. Corner, which is something new that the kids really like. Sometimes they come in missing mom, missing dad, not wanting to let them go. Um, we do have a couple stuffies. We have Miss Lovey Dog that they like to hug when they go there. Um, so I usually like punch it down so that they can snuggle right in there and then they just have it and I just let them know, hey, once you're ready, once you're calm, just come back to okay. us when you're ready. But they're there. Um, we just got some little lava lamp looking design things. <laughs> which they like to turn around and it kind of just like helps them have that time go by while they're just there with the stuffy just to calm down. It's just essentially like a little closed off area and they all respect each other with that where they're like, oh, he's there. We're going to let them calm down. That They know that's where they can go when they're either crying or they're just really yeah. tired. They just need time alone. Yes, I would. Uh, this, well, oh. that... It's a very nice movie. It is very nice. <laughs> I'm glad you like it. Is that good that we were sad to do that? 
Yes. Oh, yes. yes. Jonathan. And Jonathan gets his. You want to tell us about the house, Jonathan? Yeah. Okay, let's see. Wait, what tell you mom. Tell mom what you think. What do you like about the house? Do you don't want to say anything? What do you like to do in the house? Let's see right there. What are you doing? I like to read that. We want to be good. Thank you. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Good job. Good job. And let's, talk, let's look at some more pictures of the house, shall we? Oh, look at what they're doing. What are what they, they doing? What? Mm. Who are they taking care of? Baby. 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 Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, the, the nice thing is that they really role play and they, they work together and they're very caring about the babies and um, all the nice costumes we got with, with the TK grant too are just make it that much nicer. They pretend sometimes to be um, a restaurant and like chefs and they take orders and they've been writing down the menus and so it's really, really fun. We're getting a lot of really fantastic language out of this intentional play, especially in the house area. Yeah. This is potato. Yeah. Can you tell them about the migraine into it? You always like that, right? You want to talk about them? Those things? Yeah, I like that. <laughs> what, what did we have at the listening center? You were telling someone the other day. Uh, what, what can you listen to? CD. CDs of uh, music and good music and stories. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Did you want to add any more? Well, I. Uh, yeah, he goes there a lot. <laughs> he like the radio. Yeah. He didn't like talk about like the books. Oh, you want to talk about the books? Okay, here we go. You want to say something about the books real fast? What do you want to say about the books? Well, like the books are like perfect to read. It's like they're like clippy and you can just like put on and like so you like. It's, it's like two for the mission center in the library. Mm -hmm. like there's, there's all sorts of books that you can like read. I know. So exciting. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, all kinds of books. Thank you. Oh, yeah. These are kind of books too. Remember? Remember this and the reading? Yeah. Can you tell them? What were we doing? Like Okay. No, not those happy days. We don't have those right away. What were you learning about over here? Do you remember you told me they're in the red sack? Remember? In the red part in the green tree? Do you remember what you were growing? What? Uh, oh, right. The yeah, the science center is investigative. They they have different insects that are you know um, in the acrylic, and then we're we're growing ladybugs, so they get to observe the metamorphosis. And there's the life cycle uh, models and lots of books there. And they love the, that center. They'll go there a lot. Okay. Okay. Isla. And Isla brought some art. She wanted to share that she made. I happen to know she told her mom that what she loved about the art cafe is that she can express herself. And she and many others do that every day. They, they can cut, they can glue, they make diptychs and puppets and uh, folders and books and all kinds of things. It's 
They're, they keep inspiring each other, so it's like a little art club over there sometimes. And um, it's all self-serve, so they can just help themselves to the materials, and they just get create their own ideas. So Bodhi and Tate were taking an X-ray of your head. Why? <laughs> you hit your head. That's a construction worker. <laughs> and then, what are these guys doing? Do you have to pretend you're in the air? And you don't have to say that. Those were veterinarians, sometimes it's a vet clinic. And yeah, sometimes they use it to, to write names and stuff. And then we've got one more to show James something else to love. That's James right there. So you're moving the wheelbarrow into the box, between the boxes, and gardening and hot sauce. So we have a lot in our outdoor area, including a sandbox that is back here. And then dramatic play is a, a really big part of TK. And it includes things like the puppet theater, and sometimes they make their own puppets. Sometimes they set it up like you know, movie theater, they sell tickets, and they, they make, um, they've even made like a brochure for it, and they make popcorn to sell and money. It's kind of cute. Um, or they play out stories. I have these masks, but also just as you saw, they have a lot of costumes throughout the day so they can take on roles. And um, that really helps to develop language. I, I hear they elevate their language when they try to be someone more grown up or in a professional role. So dramatic play is really awesome. I'm so happy that we were able to develop that more. And this is Jojo. It's our last one. Are you still there? <laughs> <laughs> you know it, Jojo. Talk about it. Uh, what are you uh, 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 uh. This one's yours, right? No, that's yours. Oh, oh, there's the magnetiles. Right? Oh, that was yours. Okay. Yeah, so what, what were you making? I was trying to make a car, and this was just a lot of work. I would like to get something off my face, so actually, I was from the moon, and so they would bounce off of it from the top, from top to bottom, and then you get a signal, and then the car would drive. Oh. And then, anything else? That's Maddie and Modi building a construction puzzle with Miss Daniel. Uh -huh. Do you remember what that one was? And Tate and James are doing a manual Good job, Jojo. Music. Come play with us. I wanted just to give you a window into our awesome TK program and just huge kudos to Lori and our team for like really transforming this whole kind of shift from kind of more paper and pencil to really play-based learning and matching the kids where they're coming in now at four years old. So thanks for having us today. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
have a question. Can we go back to Lucas Airport, please? Okay. Lucas Airport. Yeah. Luca? Can you show me something? Let's see. Let's see. Airport. Hey, my name's Ryan. I have a question about your airport. I want to thought of this idea. Okay. Wait, okay, this one. These are the terminals, right? Where they get on and off? Whoops. Okay. <laughs> and so, did you say that one of these was a takeoff? Why don't they go on the same one? Like, no, no, no. What I'm saying is that you realize that if one lands here and one takes off here, they might crash, and that's why they only land this way and only take off that way. Is that what you did? Yeah. That's really smart. Yeah. I like that. I just want to make sure that's what's going on. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I just, I'm so impressed with all of you tonight. I had a TK -er and she was before they had um, such a younger age bracket. And it's so wonderful to see what you guys are doing with the play-based learning. And I'm so proud of you guys for coming here tonight. It's kind of scary to come in front of a big room of people you don't know and talk about what you're doing at school, but you guys are super brave. And I'm, you're learning so much and I'm, I'm so excited to see where you guys go. <laughs> Thank you for coming here. So, knock knock. Who's there? Who's there? Interrupting cow. Interrupting <laughs> Ready for this one? What is brown and sticky? A stick. <laughs> All righty, and that, thank you so much for talking with us and doing your presentation for us and bringing your amazing teachers, Ms. Jessica and Ms. Ladresh here tonight. And we always do something with the students when they come. And what we'd like to wonder is, do you see yourself maybe someday in the future becoming a school board member? <laughs> Sitting up here in front of everybody out in the audience and making... Oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There you go. Would, would any of you like to come up and sit here and see what it's like to be a board of trustees? Come on up. Go around the back. I will take a picture. Take a picture. You will take a picture. Check out the microphone. Oh, yeah. Look at that. You can go sit in one of the big chairs. You can sit next to JoJo. Oh, <laughs> you 
<laughs> oh, sorry, buddy. You're right. I'm sorry. Hey, James, do you know that I know this guy? I am. Um, yeah. So cute. Can I get you some coffee? No coffee. Yeah. Pretend you write your name real quick. I'll put it on the on the front. You want to tell everybody? Let me see. You can tell us who you are. Oh yeah, we're writing our name. Keep going. That's perfect. Look at you. At least write his name. You should write your name down too. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. All right, here we go. Now, come over here. Come on. Oh, yeah. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you see, you got your name tag. I got that. Oh, Got a job now. What do we, James? What do you say? It's the seat of power. Get your hammer too. That's a gift card for sale. Ice cream. Here, buddy, let's stand up. It's an ice cream. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want this piece of paper. No. Yeah, just <laughs> <laughs> ice cream you're gonna get. The I'm gonna get. Uh, let's see, what would I roll? I like chocolate. I'm getting. I'm getting chocolate. <laughs> We should have one where All right, and we are moving on with our agenda. The next item is communication. Uh, public comment regarding items not on the open session agenda. I have uh, several cards here. Uh, we have 24 here. So does anybody have input on three minutes? Any thoughts from my fellow board members? I'm inclined to do the three minutes for everybody, but what? We have 24. Okay. No, no thoughts. Okay. All right. So I'm going to um, call up 
Uh, I'm gonna call five at a time if you just wanna like wait in line behind the person sitting down so we can kind of keep it moving since there's a lot of people and I wanna make sure you guys get your time. Um, because I'm letting everybody have three minutes, please be respectful and when your time is over, please step down. We're gonna have Chris timing, I think. Okay, um, you'll have three minutes. Um, at two and a half minutes, you'll hear a chime just so you know you have 30 seconds to wrap up your last comments. Um, but please be respectful of everyone's time. This is a lot of people. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, so Evie Davis, Noe Simeon, Wilfie Wild, and Spencer Simon, if you wanna come up. No, that's fine. And if you want, are you, so you need to sit, sit down and um, can we, is that microphone turned on? So you need, you need to talk to us so we can hear you, okay? Okay. Awesome, and you can sit if you want. But if you can take, and if you can tell us your name and if you go to a certain school or, that would be helpful. Okay. But. Hi, my name is Abby Davis and I am eight years old. I go to Hidden Valley Elementary School. This year, my teacher is Miss Wortman and we've been learning about Dolores Herta and she was protesting with Caesar Chavez about fair wages working and working condition. I see a connection with what is going on in our schools. My teachers deserve a fair wage. Justice for our teachers now. Hello, my name is Wolf B and I go to Brookside School. My favorite part of school is math. My teacher is special because she makes special plans just for me. She checks on on me if, to see if I'm paying attention. And this year they taught me about Native Americans in government and office. Help teachers like this at, at my school by pairing them fairly because Ross Valley students deserve the best. <laughs> Hello, my name is Noe. I go to Brookside School. My favorite part of school is how the t all the teachers give us their best every day. My teacher is special b because she is passionate, patient, passionate, and fun with the way she teaches. Um, and this year, she has taught me to be a good person, and she has also taught me math, writing, cursive, and much more. Help, help keep teachers like this at my school by paying them fairly, because Ross Valley students deserve the best. Hello, my name is Spencer. I go to Brookside. My teacher is special because she teaches me with patience and kindness. Help keep teachers like Miss Walden at my school by paying them fairly. That was Spencer Simon, um, Augie Henderson, Teddy Henderson, Bowie Detrick, Oscar Hazel. I'm doing them in fours. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Hello, my name is Augie Henderson. I go to Brookside School. My favorite part of school is reading. My teacher is special because she's kind, nice, always helping, strict, happy a lot, and always has something new to teach. This, this year, she taught me how to use a protractor. Help keep teachers like this at my school by paying them fairly because Ross Valley students deserve the best. <laughs> Hello, my name is Teddy Henderson. I go to Brookside School. My favorite part of school is science. We hatched trout. It is so fun. I also love art. We made clay. My teacher is special because she is nice. She teaches us a lot of stuff and she and she makes me feel good. And this year she taught me glued sounds. Help keep teachers like this at my school by paying them fairly because Walsh Valley School deserves the best. Hello, my 
My name is Bowie Dietrich. I'm in third grade at Brookside. This year in school, we learned about how the government works. We each got different jobs. My job was a senator. I made a budget. We had an amount of money and a list of things we could spend it on. The first thing I put on my budget was a class movie day because that was what every, that everybody in my class needed most. If I had the job of making a budget for the school, paying the teachers would be the first thing I would put on my budget because having good and happy teachers is what my class wants most. You have the job of making the budget for my school. Please pay our teachers fairly. Hello, my name is Oscar Hazel. I go to Bookside School. I am in third grade and my teacher deserves a pay raise because you have to work hard to make a classroom of kids listen. And we learn <laughs> and we learn a lot in her class. Please pay my teachers fairly. Our school deserves the best. Thank you. Emery Hanks and Emily Nelson. Hello, my name is Owen Borch and I go to Brookside School. My favorite part of school is art, science, and social studies. My teacher is special because she is a good listener and understanding. And this year they taught me the different types of clouds. Help teachers like this at my school by paying them fairly because Ross Valley students deserve the best. Hello, my name is Ben Borshin. I go to Brookside School. My favorite part about school is reading with my teacher. My teacher is special because she is there she is very nice and supportive. What she teach you? And this year she taught me how to read. Help keep teachers like this at my school by by paying them fairly because Ross Valley students deserve the best. <laughs> Hello, my name is Hudson. I go to Brookside School. My favorite part of school is my teacher, Miss Diaz. My teacher is special because she is kind when a conflict comes up. And this year, she taught me not to give up on a hard math problem. Help keep teachers like this at my school by paying them fairly, because Ross Valley students deserve the best. My name is Emily. I go to Brookside School. My favorite part of school is directed drawing with Miss Hayhurst. My teacher is special because she is very kind and helpful. And this year she taught me how to show respectful behavior. Help keep teachers like this at my school by paying them fairly. Because Ross Valley students deserve the best. <laughs> I have no idea how to follow that up. <laughs> um, <laughs> that was amazing. You guys, amazing. Listening to you guys speak is honestly half of my speech. Um, I'm here in support of a fair wage increase for Ross Valley District. I have to believe that we all want them to be paid fairly. Um, I've sat through at least a few me meetings listening to the challenges our teachers face and their dedication to this district. Um, I, even just listening to these kids right now, it really compels me to consider 
how much time our kids are in class with these teachers and what an impact they make on these lives. I think we all can remember in our life one amazing teacher that got us, you know, to learn something amazing, something that was a challenge for us or, um, you know, get us through a rough year or just inspired us to feel good about ourselves. Um, and I think we can also probably remember at some point a teacher that maybe didn't do that. Um, <sighs> I think we also know that employees are much happier and more satisfied when they feel valued. Um, and I, I'm, I'd like to ask that question to everybody, like how can we make them feel more valued? And what they're saying is that they want to be paid a fair wage that gives them an opportunity to ha you know, pay their bills and live here in this district without making um, severe life changes. I mean, I, um, as I sat through some of these meetings, some of the things that stood out to me, um, I'm gonna re-quote. Um, I have no heat in my car. I'm driving here in the rain on bald tires. I'm living paycheck to paycheck. I grew up here and can no longer afford to live here. I commute 40 minutes to live where I can afford to live, meaning they commute 40 minutes to get here. I took a large pay cut in order to work here in this district from one district over. We have been asked for years to do more with less. You have to stop relying on moms who want to work at their kids' school this isn't a hobby job. What I've also heard is, I love where I work. I have the best coworkers. We have something very special here in Ross Valley. Thank you. Kelly Crossley, Emily Elder, John Fee, Allison Rowan, and Sammy Hundley. I'm sorry, I'm wearing the wrong color because I rushed here. Um, my name is Kelly Crossley, and I have three kids in the Ross Valley School District. Quinn is in the seventh grade at Whitehill, Olive is in the fourth grade, and Mabel is in the first grade at Brookside. My mom is also the librarian at Brookside. I have a lot of passion for our schools and the support of our teachers. I grew up with my mom as a teacher and I remember the hard work and dedication she did at home in addition to all the effort and passion at school. She had a special place in her heart for all the children and now does it today at Brookside. I see what each and every teacher does at Brookside. I'm amazed by their hard work and dedication just like my mom had. I know that they care for these children as if they were their own. My own kids are going through some very hard things, and these teachers have been by their side and mine every step of the way. I want to show our support for all of them, and so that's why I'm here today, to show how they are, as they have shown support for my family. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, Emily Elder. Um, first of all, thank you for your service. I don't envy the hard work and the position you're all in, and you do it for our children and our community, and I appreciate that. Um, I have three kids in Ross Valley. I've actually, I'm on my 10th year at Brookside, which is amazing. It's almost a fourth of my life, but I didn't go to school there myself. Um, but it's a long time as a parent, and I, as I reflected back on this decade of Brookside, we've seen so much, uh, as you all well know. Um, we lived through a multi-purpose building being being built while having recess, you know, right outside. Obviously, COVID and hybrid learning. Um, we've gone through three permanent 
uh, principals in one year, which was incredible when the principal left, I want to say in September, and we had so many principals on the interim basis, two shared the job and every other day it was someone else. And if you were to ask my three kids, they wouldn't remember any of that. Um, they would remember being in Mrs. Puckett's cozy corner or Miss Walden acting as Miss Zucchini and teaching math over Zoom. And after only being with Miss Walden in person for maybe six weeks of the year, she was my daughter's favorite teacher of all time, uh, interacting over Zoom. Um, this is incredible. My kids remember these teachers that have been at Brookside for a really long time. Through all the instability, it's the stability of these teachers that have made not just the kids okay, but thrive. Um, and we can't lose that because no fancy building or new curriculum will do what these teachers have done for our kids holding their hands through COVID or loss of a parent of really big things. And these teachers have been there and they deserve to live in our community. We need them in our community and our kids need them. So thank you for all the hard work and decisions you have to make. Our kids, thank you and the community. Thanks you. All right, hello, go ahead, Chris. Um, start the clock. Hey, I'm uh, John Fee, um, first time caller, long time listener. I was here uh, recently, um, didn't like what I heard, um, but I think there's a change happening in this community and I think everybody in this room is part of that change. Heck, last time I was here, only one half of the room was wearing red. Is it a coincidence? Even Chris has a pop of color of red underneath that shirt. Change is happening. So. Um, and I think that's has to do with alignment is, is coming. Uh, and I thought we'd start with the Ross Valley School District mission. It's not my mission, it's your mission. It's two very long run on sentences. There's people in this room that could probably help you with it. <laughs> uh, it says, our mission is to provide the quality educational experience all students deserve. You got folks that do this 24 seven, um, sitting and standing behind me. Continuing on with the same sentence, sentence, which is grounded in best practices, it's what they do. Teachers, um, reflects the highest academic standards, it's what they do. I have a, another son in Ms. Tessator's math class, it's hard, it's a high academic standard, I like it. Um, the sentence continues and is responsive to community expectations. That's why I'm here. I'm expecting that we pay these people more because of the work that they do in the community for all of our kids. The second sentence says, we keep the focus, remember this is your mission, we keep the focus on our students. It's what they do. It's why they wake up every day, to keep the focus on the students. Um, and we are committed to providing a program of academic excellence, cultural richness, richness social, social, emotional, and physical development that educates, supports, challenges, and inspires the whole child. <laughs> Sounds like teachers to me. If this was a film and that was the script, the leading role is played by the people behind me. These are not extras in this film. They're the leading role, the leading role in delivering this mission that we have for Ross Valley School District. So I'm not, I'm not asking everybody to do something that they don't wanna do. I just read it in your mission. It's on your website. It's got your names next to it and email addresses. You know what your mission is. It's the mission of this room. We've got to deliver on this mission. And to do that, we've got to support the people playing the leading role in that mission. And that's the teachers. I'm on time. I'm gonna pass the mic. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Allison Rowan, and I am the TK aide at Brookside. I'm actually not here tonight in that capacity. I'm actually here tonight as my favorite, best, most important job. I am a Brookside and a Whitehill parent, and this is actually what I do best. So let me reintroduce myself. My name is Allison Studebaker, and I'm mom to Dara and Aoife. Dara is a seventh grader at Whitehill, and Aoife is a proud third grader at Brookside. Both of my kids have IEPs. My son is in the SDC class at Whitehill and is one of Sarah Hom's first students from her SDC, and probably one of her favorites, <laughs> of her SDC program at Brookside. Aoife uses the services of the Resource Center and also receives OT as part of her IEP. She's had her IEP since the first days of the now defunct early intervention program at Brookside. I'm here on behalf of all of the special ed and IEP parents of our district. 
every year around July, we as parents of special ed kids at Ross Valley, we start to worry. We start worrying about what the next school year is going to bring. Primarily, we worry if our child's teacher is actually going to return for the new year. Are the aides that my child works really well with and connects with, are they coming back? Who's the OT going to be? Will it be the same OT as last year? Who's the speech teacher? Will our school counselor come back? Who is going to be in the resource center? Who will actually be taking care of my kids' IEPs? If none of these teachers and specialists come back, then I will have to explain yet again who my child is, what they need, who's keeping track, are progress goals on their IEPs being updated, or do I have to read on the IEP document as I just did, sorry, no updates at this time because we didn't have a teacher. This is unacceptable. This is our special ed, these that are special ed parents that we have to continually ask these same questions every single year. I've been a, a parent in this district for nine years now, and in that time, we've seen combined between my son and my daughter, nine different speech teachers, at least six different OTs, four different school psychologists, and at least four different resource specialists. My son is in his second year at Whitehill. And in a short year and a half, he's had two different SDC teachers along with too many subs to keep track of. He started this year with an emergency sub and my daughter started her year with no resource teacher. She's now on her second resource teacher in six months. And now, unfortunately, our parents are going to be faced with yet another change of recent job postings or anything to go by. We're now on the lookout for yet another SDC teacher and resource teacher and the cycle just continues. These are our most vulnerable students and the students in most need of consistency and structure and they're the students and their parents need to know that their needs are being met. Attracting and most importantly, retaining the best teachers across the board needs to be your priority. It's in your hands. Give the teachers, specialty or not, the pay that they deserve. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sammy Hunley, and I'm a fourth grade teacher at Brookside Elementary. I have been teaching for nine years, but last year was my first year in the district. When applying for the position, I paid close attention to the school district's philosophies to make sure that they were aligned with my values. I fell in love with Ross Valley. Now, on my second year in the district, I revisited not only the district's philosophies, but also the board's. The board has 20 total core beliefs, values, and tenets, and I would like to take a look at two that resonated with me. Number five, that highly skilled and dedicated teachers and educational support staff have the capacity to guide students toward individual achievement and growth and have a direct and powerful influence on student learning and life experiences. When we are not able to obtain or retain special education teachers, reading specialists, speech pathologists, occupational therapists, or K through five teachers, it puts a strain on the whole staff. Let's take a look at what happens when one of these positions is not filled, such as a speech pathologist. First, students will experience difficulty with reading and or spelling in class, and teachers will work overtime to make sure that these students are supported and have access to the curriculum. Other specialists will now be pulled in to work on the management of those services. Students will need compensatory minutes, meaning that they will need to be pulled out of class more often later on in the year when the position is filled. Lack of services often creates frustration and distrust among these families, even though teachers are powerless over filling the job position. And this not only impacts students who receive speech services, it affects all students when staff must lean in in one way or another to fill gaps. And as a result, teachers do not have the capacity to spend their lunches or extra time leading green team executive council in yearbook. This is if just one of the positions is not filled. Teachers are well above capacity. We can't fill positions and we can't fill positions without a competitive sal salary. The second core belief that resonated with me was number 10. Students and staff are encouraged and motivated by high expectations and recognition for their accomplishments. I do feel motivated by my coworkers, by Barbara Forshi, who has been teaching for 20 years and who still sees herself as a lifelong learner, going out of her way to new, learn new technologies, programs, and curriculum, by Alicia Hanks, who is our part-time intervention and reading language development teacher, but who is at school full-time, going out of her way to work with teachers during lunch and off hours to support students by Sarah Hom, who is at school before 6.30 a.m. with a newborn at home so that she has time to prep and make sure her students receive what they need each day. I could go on. 
However, I do not feel that these individuals or Ross Valley teachers are being recognized for their incredible accomplishments each and every day. The current 2% increase falls well short of recognizing the amount of work we do day in and day out. Please take a look at your board philosophies and ask yourself what you believe teachers deserve. Thank you. Susan Ardigo. Ardigo, sorry. Susan Ardigo. Uh, Hannah Moss. Anna Schnell. Priya Mather. Uh, Sarah Horky and Karen Tessator. Hi, <clears throat> my name is Susan Artigo. I'm a teacher at Wade Thomas. Um, I'm here to tonight to address numbers and trust. Specifically, I'd like to address the inaccurate numbers being shared with community members through email responses from the board. First, I was shocked to see the district share information at the last board meeting that was no longer valid and did not explicitly state that it was not accurate anymore. It was very misleading. I'm talking about the slide shared in the budget presentation that showed a compensation, compensation table from the 22-23 school year showing RVSD was 11th out of the 17 districts in Marin after the 9% salary increase last year. What was left out is that most of those districts have jumped past us again this year after already finalizing increases and many have settled for next school year as well. This obsolete inaccurate information was then cited repeatedly in Trustee Litwack's responses to multiple emails from the community. Um, you need to do the homework. You need to know your numbers. It took me all of about five minutes to check the data on the slide against the pay and realize it was no longer accurate. I checked because I had seen the same graphs showing RVSD is at the bottom of those comparisons. And these are graphs that I know that you all too have seen, yet you didn't follow up and you disseminated information that was incorrect. So using the same metrics from the slide, RVSD is not 11th out of 17 Marin school districts on the salary schedule. Currently right now, RVSD sits at 14 out of 17 for beginning teacher pay, 15 out of 17 for mid and end of career salaries, and notably behind us at 16 and 17 are our two rural districts, Nicosia, which serves 45 total students, and Laguna, which I had never heard of, which serves 21 total students in the entire district. Uh, they're in Marin County, but they're not comparable districts. We are at the bottom. So by the way, your proposed 2% 2, 2 increase does not change this. This will not attract new and diverse teachers, nor does it work to retain the excellent qualified invested teachers you currently count on every day to lead this district and its students. Numbers matter. Numbers matter every day in our lives and our families' lives. Numbers will be the difference between RVSD keeping all of these excellent committed educators who are in this room who are literally your leaders, your curriculum leaders, your grade level, grade level leaders, your district leadership representatives, teachers who step up to work extra to sit on committees, pilot new curriculums, mentor new teachers, have PD during the summer, who for example, provide middle school students with opportunities like lunchtime clubs, extra periods, even the trip to DC. We are your community liaisons and your student advocates. And these are the people that you don't want to lose. The board may not know all of our names, but it's these teachers that hold our district together. So numbers do matter, facts matter, and there's a reason that trustee is in the name of your job. So please check the facts and make sure that what you are sharing is accurate and current. Thank you. special because she teaches us Spanish and this year she taught me basic algorithm. Help keep teachers like this at my school by paying them fairly because Ross Valley students deserve the best. My name is Anna Schnell, and I have been teaching at Hidden Valley for 20 years, and I have three children in the district. My oldest child, Lily, started with RSV, RVSD in TK. I was thinking back to how many teachers she has had that have left the district. I'll go over it with you. Her TK teacher is no longer here. Her kindergarten teacher left to live in an area that was more affordable with a higher pay. Her first grade teacher also left to go live in an area where she could buy a home. 
Her third and fourth grade teacher also chose not to stay at Ross Valley and purchased a home in Sonoma County. Out of seven years in elementary school here, only two teachers remain. At middle school, she has had amazing teachers that have inspired her, supported her, and have fostered a love of learning. Her teachers have created communities within their classrooms that makes her feel included, which is so important in middle school. She enjoys and feels successful in science, which is so important for a teenage girl. She has teachers that allow her to visit them before and after school, and I appreciate how available they are to her. My fear is that we will lose these amazing teachers like we have lost so many elementary school teachers over time and that my two younger children will not benefit from them. Here's a little secret for all of you. We all have friends in other districts and they're hiring and they give, I mean, I know many of us have gotten a phone call about an opening at their school, not even having to apply, but getting those phone calls, hey, there's a couple of openings. And it's getting really, really difficult not to say no. Um, your PowerPoints make it look like the worst case scenario for this district is to go negative and to make some important and necessary cuts. But I'm here to tell you that the worst case scenario for our districts is that we lose teachers and that we can't find teachers to fill those positions. That would mean that we have start years with classrooms without a designated teacher. And I will tell you, that is how we lose enrollment. People will not want to send their children to schools that do not have qualified teachers. This could have a snowball effect that can completely destroy our district. It's our amazing district. This is a real possibility, and I wish you could just look past the numbers that have been presented to you and see the long-term impacts of, ignore, ignore, of ignoring the pleas of your teachers. Thank you. Hi, Priya Mother. Um, I have two daughters in the Ross Valley School District, one at White Hill and one at Hidden Valley. Our family is so grateful for the extraordinary learning environment that we've experienced here. The environment is created, as you all know, uh, not by the buildings, equipment, or even the books in the schools, but by the dedicated educators who cultivate enth an enthusiasm for learning and offer tools that support our kids' growth. As a member of this community, I admit I feel ashamed that many of our teachers are not earning a living wage and cannot stay in this community. I myself served in public office for 16 years and I truly appreciate and respect the difficult job that you all have. It is not easy to balance a constrained budget. But I challenge you to think creatively about how we can ensure the sustainability of our schools and the stability of the educators who make our schools the treasures that they are. And I challenge all the rest of us to support a new parcel tax or other funding measure to increase our school district's funding so that we can sustain that over the long term. Thank you. Hello, I'm Sarah Horky, um, and I am reading for a teacher from my site who is sick at home and cannot be here tonight. I just read through all the letters sent to the board this week from over 40 Ross Valley School District parents and the White Hill Special, Special Education team in support of our teachers and programs. The response from the board to each and every one of those letters is that we have an underfunded budget and that this year our expenses are $1 million more than our revenues and that we are spending our reserves. The response from the board to every single one of those letters is, if we could provide the raises the union's asking for this year, we will burn through the entire district's reserves in just two years. I recently saw next door, of all places, a frequently asked a frequently FAQ document put out by districts regarding current negotiations, and they're also stated over and over again, it is about the raises the union is asking for this year, or what the teachers are asking for as the reason we will burn through the entire district's reserves in just two years. Question eight in the FAQ doc has a breakdown of what our teachers make and lists the average salaries depending on years of experience and about how many teachers are at each level. Now that the district has put a call out for help to the community to find solutions to this budget problem, wouldn't it be useful to see a similar breakdown 
for all the district employee groups. At the last board meeting, and in that same FAQ doc, we learned that the monthly payroll obligation for the entire district is 1.9 million. That's for the entire district. So in reference to the question of the district's reserves that many of us are asking about, shouldn't we also be looking at the salaries and probably the recent raises of all employee groups, not just RVTA, but the CS, C, CSEA, confidential classified, classified management and certificated management? Thank you. Good evening. Um, I am Karen Tessator. I am the president of RVTA. Um, what I have tonight is a petition that all of the teachers and educators in our district have signed, and I'm going to read to you the letter. Um, Dear Chairs Litwack, Landless Cobb, Cassidy, Hamilton, and O'Neill, a decision to go to an impasse is not made in a vacuum. Many of our members already struggle to make ends meet. We do not want to strike, but it's time to get serious and settle our contract in a way that honors and respects the work educators do every day and protects the work we've done to, to support the students, families, and community. Our working conditions are our students' learning conditions. We are proud to work in Ross Valley, and we deserve more than a 2% raise. Our stu students deserve to have educators who can afford to stay with the district. It is time to prioritize a meaningful wage, wage increase and other benefits for our educators. We will continue to show up and fight for our right for a reasonable salary increase because our students deserve the best. Sincerely, the Ross Valley Teachers Association. Thank you. Moving on with our agenda, we're going to correspondence and communication with the board. Um, there are several items listed there. Did everybody read them? Yeah, okay. So moving on, we're going to presentation and or action items. Um, item F1 is consider approving the purchase and sale agreement and adopting a sale resolution of the Deer Park property located at 199 Porteous Avenue in Fairfax to the Cedarman Legacy Children's Fund. All right, thank you. And at the February 21st uh, board meeting, the board authorized staff to um, entertain conversations, pursue um, third party nonprofits um, regarding the purchase and sale of the Deer Park property, as long as any of those entities um, would continue to lease the property to the Fairfax San Anselmo Children's Center. And so I'm very thankful that a third party nonprofit has been identified. Um, there is a purchase sale agreement that has been assigned. So it's the Siderman Legacy Children's Fund. And um, so very happy tonight to have representatives from the Cidermans. And I think Andrew Giacomini and anyone else tonight with you for this? Yeah, sure. I'm here for the Ciderman Fund. For the Ciderman Fund. Okay, thank you so much. There's other board members. Excellent. All right. And we do have our attorney, um, Terry Tao, on the uh, conference phone as well. Um, so tonight, as Rachel mentioned, um, for the board to entertain consideration of a purchase sale agreement and also adoption of a resolution um, related to the uh, sale of the Deer Park property to the Siderman Legacy Children's Fund. And so, Terry, do you want to start uh, this evening? Of course. All right, can we do a uh, sound check, Terry? Thank you very much. So, uh, the district has received and we have, uh, as legal counsel, gone through and approved a purchase and sale agreement in form that has been finalized and fi signed by the Siderman's Legacy Children's Fund. It
it is a nonprofit 501c3 corporation set up for subsidized child care. The purpose is to lease to the uh, Fairfax and Anselmo Children's Center in perpetuity under this uh, 501c3 arrangement. This purchase and sale agreement has a $2 million purchase price, a 60-day escrow. It is an as-is sale. Um, there are provisions within the document for reversion if there should be a failure to maintain it as a children's center or use the property as a children's center. There is a reservation in case the district should have to turn uh, a location into a school. Um, there is an anticipated $200,000 non-refundable deposit uh, that will be uh, deposited into escrow that should be open within three days after the board approves this item. In addition, we've received 801A documents, which is backup documentation uh, with regard to how the discount rate was calculated. A resolution to sell the property has been prepared and placed on this agenda. This resolution uh, identifies that the district has met all of the requirements associated with application of Ed Code Section 17458, that we've gone through all the surplus property requirements associated with the property. The 711 committee uh, advisory committee had been established. California Environmental Quality Act has been completed. Naylor Act requirements have been completed and offers have been made, including uh, several offers associated with a February 18th board meeting where uh, we wanted to explore other third party entities. Um, very quickly, there is a, um, a technical requirement that I will mention. Uh, since the, uh, if the sale does not go through, uh, one of the technical issues we uh, had asked for was a, uh, we had started an eviction action. Uh, what we asked for was a stipulated agreement so that we would have all the loose ends wrapped up so there will be a little bit of technical requirements associated with just the filing of an eviction action. We've got a stipulation. Everything is um, its really technical uh, in order to address some of the issues uh, with regards to safety and liability that we talked about for the past year. Uh, so with that, the board has in front of you uh, a completed purchase and sale agreement and a resolution documenting the sale. Uh, so this is ready for discussion, and I'm here to answer any questions. Does anybody have questions about this amendment right now? Chris? Okay. Terry, can you hear me? It's Chris Landis Cobb. Yes. <clears throat> Just a question about the reversionary clause on how, how we'll um, retain information on its compliance going forward. Uh, just wanted to understand a little bit about our role there and what, what that's going to look like. So the reversionary clause actually has um, some requirements with regards to uh, the children's center, uh, a children's center that is a subsidized children's center remaining on the property. There's actually a code section that we've been um, worried about for quite some time. It's Education Code Section 17462.3. What that section addresses is the ability of the state to pull back any funds that were um, associated with state funding for either the acquisition of the property or the construction of property. Uh, so there is an exception with regard to application of the section of the education so code section that we used at code section 17458. If you should, for some reason, there's a deviation from that requirement, uh, then there is the possibility that the state could ask us for return of funds. So it will require us to uh, ensure that the property follows what it is that's in the reversionary clause. What I would suggest is probably a review yearly uh, of the uses of the property uh, just to make sure that we don't essentially have a call from the state 
asking for us to cough up money. So uh, that is the one issue with reversionary clause, and that's why it's there. So Terry, it's Rachel, I had a question. Um, so basically what you just said, if the site is not being used as intended, then the state could theoretically come back and ask us for the $2 million? Correct. We are, we are actually tracked by the state. Uh, there is something called an unused site list. Uh, and uh, this Deer Park property has been on that unused site list for many, many years. Uh, so the state has reserved for itself the ability to pull back funds. Uh, we've been involved in a couple of those cases where uh, state funds were utilized and then later on the school is closed and sold. It all comes about with regards to the selling of property. If for some reason you actually had to execute on the reversionary clause because it's no longer being used and it reverted back, you would not have to cough up the money and return it. Uh, so this clause has always been a bit of a problem. The idea is the state gave you the money, therefore the state always has control over what it is that happens and is used on the property. Thanks, Terry. One other question about the, the money that we get from a sale of a property. Is that, does that have to be used for buildings or structures or can we use that for salaries? You cannot. There is a code section, Ed Code Section 17462. It applies when you've received state funds. And in this case, the eminent domain of the property was done through state funds in the 1950s. The construction of the property uh, in Deer Park was done around 1952, also with state funds. Um, when state funds are utilized, then uh, the uh, Proceeds associated with the sale are required to be placed into a capital facilities account for facilities purposes. Okay, thank you. Anyone else have a question? I have another. Uh, Terry, Shelley. this is Shelley. Um, you had mentioned the uh, eviction stipulation, and I know that's a it's a parallel. It's not part of the purchase agreement, and I just want to make sure I understand that uh, terminology correctly. So that's a, a stipulation that would mean, which, which I'm really appreciative of it being a cooperative agreement, it sounds like, um, so that we don't have to go through the whole judicial process, or could you just explain how that works a little bit? Of course. Re just remember, I'm an attorney, so my job is to take care of all the loose ends, make sure that there are no problems, and to for foresee if there are any problems that occur in the future, even if there's a one or 2% chance of a problem occurring. I don't have any expectations that this purchase agreement will not, if the, once the board approves it, that we will not be able to finalize and close the escrow. But the board had authorized me previously to file an eviction action um, in order to protect the board against any possible safety related problems from uh, some of the some of the fact that this site had um, issues from no improvements over the past many decades. Uh, because of the fact that I needed to file an eviction action, one of the things that made more sense to me, especially if we're doing a purchase and sale agreement, rather than expending costs going down this parallel path of doing an actual eviction action, and um, then having the sale go through and trying to explain everything and deal with all the court actions, what we asked for was what's called a stipulated judgment. And a stipulated judgment is basically a just in case if everything does not work out, we don't have to spend all this money and the Children's Center doesn't have to spend all this money on an eviction action. So for technical purposes, there's a couple of court-related items that I need to do. Uh, so I don't want anybody to be scared or worried if you see later that there's a filing of, a, of an eviction action. It's all been discussed with the Children's Center. We um, have the details all worked out. We will not be executing. You will not be going through an eviction. The goal is to get this purchase and sale agreement done, uh, to have this property sold, and then we would pay essentially 
let the court know and tear up all the paperwork. Do we have any more questions from the board for Terry? No more questions, but if you want to hear from us as uh, we'll trustees, do that after we're public happy comment. to do that. <laughs> yeah, you can come back to the board after public comment unless there's more questions here for anybody. Okay. All right. Do we have public comments? Yeah. All right. So um, give everybody three minutes. Do you want to come into the the table up here. I've got John Elkin and Barbara Kohler. And before you start, you'll hear a buzzer at two minutes and 30 seconds and then a second one. Hi, uh, board. Uh, my name is John Elkin. I'm a, a resident of Fairfax for about five years. Um, I just recently at this very late date became aware that the meadow behind Deer Park School is part of the school property. Um, I had assumed it was water district property because it is mostly water district around that area. Um, and I know that people in Fairfax have been trying to get a dog park installed somewhere in the city for years and haven't come up on a good site. And I assumed that it would be a long process with the water district or with someone, some open space district. So Fortuitously, right at this time when you're about to execute this agreement, I became aware that this is school district property and um, could potentially be a site for a dog park. I'm talking about the meadow behind the school. So just to be clear, I do support the um, sale of the school to the Children's Center, um, but I'm concerned that that open area, which is currently, it just appears to be open space or a park, um, that from what I read, there are no restrictions on how that could be used by the Children's Center or potentially um, public use could be restricted in the future. Um, and actually that includes the school itself, which currently is open to the public after hours. I think that's a stipulation of their, um, their current lease. And um, so I would ask that, I, I see in, in your resolution that there are a few covenants proposed there on the use of the land. And so another one that I would request that you add is that the open space behind the school continue to be available as open space and or a park. I mean, maybe eventually turned into a dog park, but at least available as open space. And that the school itself, um, the playground and outside areas be available to the public after hours. Um, and uh, yeah, as I said, I realize this is very late in the game to bring this up, but I just became aware of it. And I wish someone in Fairfax, in the town of Fairfax or the town council or the Parks and Recreation Commission had brought this to your attention earlier. I think there were people there that were aware of this, uh, but I, I wasn't. So I'm coming to you at this last minute to ask. Thank you. Good evening. Chair Litwack and trustees of the Ross Valley School District Board. I'm the mayor of Fairfax, Barbara Kohler. And just to clarify, we are not pursuing any changes to your purchase and sales agreement. We are very supportive of the sale to the Siderman Legal Legacy Children's Fund. And you probably know that uh, about a month ago, uh, we committed to a $25,000 donation to support the sale. At that point, we thought it would be to the Children's Center, but we are happy to bring a change that would transfer those monies instead to the Siderman Legacy Children's Fund. And I wanna say um, I'm really happy to be here tonight. It's been a long road, and I know for you guys it's been an incredibly long road, but I'm really happy to see that the team uh, working with the Children's Center and your attorney, as well as all of you, are looking towards this positively. I think this really sends a great message to all of our communities. So we appreciate your attention to this matter, and we're not interested in getting the middle of your purchase and sales agreement. And um, thank you for your time and listening to me over the last year and a half.
Yeah, you can come up. Just let us know your name and affiliation. Thank you. Oh, I'm Eileen Brown, um, a longtime observer of Ross Valley politics and one-time resident. Um, <clears throat> I'm really glad this is appearing to be coming to a solution. I appreciate all of your hard work. Um, I, I wanted to point out that currently the, the Children's Center serves less than 100 kids. And I, I also heard that there's a waiting list of like 900 kids. So I would ask the town of Fairfax to really get behind expanding the Children's Center once the purchase is in place to serve more children, because there's a desperate need in our community. So thank you. OK, so we're all done with public comment. Um, we can bring it back to the board so we can discuss among ourselves. I don't know if somebody would like to kick it off. Please feel free. Wait, excuse me? Um, from from earlier. Oh, uh, you can ask if they're willing to talk. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I have questions. Um, first of all, this has been a long road. Like Barbara said, is right, and um, um complex problems um need real forward-thinking people to get in front of this to make things work. And I'm really proud of my team, our team, the team before this, um, for really digging in and trying to put some ego aside and, and, and do what we always knew was right, which was to try to solve this very complex problem. Uh, I struggled with a lot of the public's um, response to how we went about our business. I still struggle with it, but Again, that's not how you solve problems. That's just a growth, you know. Um, and you know, you, you could see the public really cared about this. And and I'm really proud of our group because we really cared about this too, despite what we were hearing from the other side of the microphones. Um, and I'm really proud of all of you um, for really digging in to try to make what we always knew was right, and at the same time, make sure that um, we did our fiduciary responsibility to our volunteer positions. And th th these are volunteer roles. There's no comma in a paycheck because there's no paycheck. And it's hard to sit up here and take speaker after speaker after speaker telling you that you're not um, doing what's right when your fiduciary, fiduciary responsibility is to do a certain task. Um, I like what's been proposed, and I'm, I'm proud that we started working um, with people at the end of this solution, regardless how long to, to get here, who could provide a solution. Um, there's a hole in this proposal as I see it, and I wanted to expose it. I like the fact that we're getting uh, some valuation in, um, for the property that is worth something. I like the fact that the reversionary clause is in place to protect our school district assets should we need this in case of some kind of emergency. And I like the fact that it was granted to us exactly as we asked. One thing that's not in this proposal, which I brought up as a concern of mine, um, I'd, like, I'd like to put out to the community. And that is, um, as a trustee, this makes a lot of sense to me on the surface of this deal. And I like that. I like that we got to a solution. As a leader in my community, I have always been concerned, not just for removing our liability and getting a monetary uh, value for it and moving on. I have always been concerned with the children's safety. And that has always been a massive roadblock for me in this process. It wasn't just about selling it and moving on. We are in these positions because we care about children. And not just the children that we represent in our schools, but all children. And it was very difficult for me as a trustee, and I'll speak for myself, to try to negotiate and remove what is obvious in reports in regards to the safety of children. And in this deal, I call on the community that was originally called on, which didn't really step up in the very beginning of this process. And I challenge the community to stand up and, re and make sure that we follow through with the safety upgrades for children at this site. There is no clause in this, in this, settle, in this offer, in this purchase agreement, that has any teeth, in my opinion, to make sure that 
the people that are taking on this responsibility and this burden of a responsibility to make a very unsight, an unsafe site safe. And as I look in the proposal that was given to us on the 18th of January, I read phase 1A estimated $1 million to include parking lots, ADA ramps, retaining walls, best in class fire alarm system, um, and, and, and HVAC bathrooms, all these things. It's right here. It was submitted by the Children's Center to us. And phase 1B, which was another $2 million of their estimates, included reconfiguration of a boiler room, reconfiguration of boys and girls bathrooms, reconfiguration of electrical systems. These things are very important to me. And these things should be important to everybody. And, and I can see that we're at a point where we're making some amazing progress and good for us. But I challenge the community and those who have, who have stepped up on behalf of this wonderful Children's Center program to assure the community, not us, the community that these upgrades for the safety of children will be followed through. Because at the end of the day, that's really what this was all about all along. It wasn't about their program. It was about the safety of the children at this site. And I'll remind the community also that phase two of the estimated cost upgrades that we were given by the Children's Center that they wanted to do if we sold it to them were another estimated three to five million dollars. And I just want the community to remember that if we can make um, this possible, because I believe it's a great win-win-win for everyone involved, I just challenge all the leadership that stepped up late in the game here that's making this happen to not abandon it now. Because now, if this works, the work is just starting to make this place safe for the children that we are fighting for. And I challenge the leadership and the people that decided to step up for this program to make sure that we follow through to make sure that this is a safe place for children. Um, <clears throat> I haven't been on this board for a very long time. I stepped into this position with very big ideas on what I thought was the right thing to do until I realized that the word fiduciary came into my job description. <laughs> and it was a hard struggle for me because I will say that many of the families that use the center, many of the children that use the center, they're members of my tribe. These kids are friends with my children. They come into my home. They come to our birthday parties. We spend time with their families. We go to their family events. And the center, as it's been presented on so many levels from the community, from my perspective, as I sit behind the table, from my personal perspective on the other side of the table, is that it has always been an important aspect of our community. There is not one person up here that does not agree with that. I am a very positive person. Those that know me know that I always see the bright side. And I think that this is a phoenix rising from the ashes. I really believe, as I look out in the audience and some of you I've spoken to and trust, that you will not let these children down. They will walk into a facility one day and have such a sense of pride and care that, that the thought of it even being any different from any other joy that they felt from day one will continue. And I wanna thank you for that. And I, I look forward to watching it grow into the center we all envision that it will be. This has not been an easy path. <coughs> um, we've disliked each other along the way. <laughs> um, but I think that the level of concern and care has never wavered from the fact that it's, it's definitely something we never ever wanted to see go away. So um, as a parent, as a resident, as a trustee, uh, but mainly as a mom that loves a lot of these kids that use this center, um, 
I sit here today and I, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very hopeful. And I just wanted you to know that. Um, yeah, I share the optimism and the hope. And I, and I wanted to, as I look out and I see, gosh, so many faces, almost all of people that I um, have known in multiple hats uh, that I wear in my community um, over many, many years and various relationships and be appreciative of the group of people who have come here tonight. Um, I really appreciate what's happened recently in terms of coming to the table. I felt like there was an intention to, to get this done, but there were pieces that we needed in our roles up here um, in order to close up this process and to be able to substantiate the findings that we would need to make to make this decision because for me, the goal all along has been able to make a decision and have it stick and have it work. The worst thing when you're sitting up here is to make a decision and at the 11th hour, something shows up or somebody shows up or you missed something or you don't have the documentation that you need to, um, to have it follow through. And so I'm, I'm very much appreciative that we received the documentation from the funders to help us substantiate the decision and to know that it's gonna follow through from a monetary. So thank you so much for those of you who sent us the letters of commitment for the funding. Very much appreciate that. That's, that's, that, that helps, that's what we needed. Um, I appreciate, I told Julia before she had to walk out the door uh, that I really appreciated her stepping up as the board chair of the Children's Center to get us the documentation on the cross enrollment data that we needed to be able to put into place the discount factor that we have been talking about since I think one of our very, very first working group meetings. So it was an intention, but the intention needs to translate into action. And so I, I think as you mentioned, I, I believe through all the ups and downs of all of this, those intentions have been there, but atten it, intentions don't translate into tangible action for kids. And so I'm appreciative that we now have what we need um, for our decision tonight. And it's all before us to make that decision. Um, we have the clarity. Um, we've had the can-do passion all along. And I really appreciate my colleagues up here for sticking in here. I know there have been many times where that's been hard to do. And for me, the only reason that I was able to hang in there for so long was because of my core belief in it being the right thing to do. And you just keep trying. You just keep at it. Um, and we did. So thank you, colleagues, for hanging in there and keeping, keeping on, keeping on. Um, And, and it, takes, it takes compassion for each other even in conflict and compassion for each other's different roles and understanding that we all play different roles and that it took all of these different people and organizations and efforts to come together to make aligned contributions. It wouldn't have happened without it getting funded. It wouldn't have happened without a third party non nonprofit stepping forward and saying, with that can-do attitude of, okay, let's get the documentation together, let's pull it all together, we can make this happen. It wouldn't have happened without us sticking in there and, um, and, and working together and coming up with every idea, working, finding from the very beginning the exception to the regular pathway so that we could do a direct sale and not have to go to, um, to the standard process, so. I'm definitely feeling hopeful, positive. I think we have what we need. And I'm feeling appreciative that we, all of the pieces um, have come together. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Did you have anything? 
yeah, as, as the new guy, I came into this just 13 months ago. So I, I don't have the same history that all of you have and, and all of you up on the board. So it was a really interesting um, way of getting involved in local governments for my first time. So, um, but yeah, this is a, a total win-win, right? We're, everybody's on board. The support is there. Everybody here feels good about this. Um, so to me, it's, it's the right thing to do. Um, with a lot of community support that I, I don't know, it didn't seem like was there when I initially came onto the board, but it got there over time. Um, painful for both sides, I'm sure. Um, yeah, I mean, this is, this is a win-win. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, just wanted to address the what I think was somewhat of an easement and just confirm that the easements that are on the property remain in, intact, that we're selling the property with the current easements as is. That's correct. Okay. So, uh, whatever easements are on the property, whatever access, um, utilities or otherwise, um, all remain on the property. Those have not changed. Thank you. I don't have a whole lot to add other than the fact that this has been a very long process and I'm really relieved to see the end of it and, and the way that it's going. Um, I know it's been hard to sit through a lot of public comments, but I always understood that the people were concerned about their families and their livelihoods and their children and where they were. And so for me, I just felt compassion as we were going along and listening to all the stories that we were hearing. And I understand why people were here and I, you know, we were listening. We're listening to the public. We're making these decisions now. We've gotten to this point now because we have been listening the whole time um, to our community, to the children's and our families, um, to each other. Um, and I agree with Ryan. Safety has always been my concern. So I am hopeful that the people that we have involved now and the other community leadership that we've had who've stepped up, who've donated money, who have helped in many ways and been very vocal, I hope that all of them remain vocal and making sure that the upgrades are made I'm sure they will because, you know, they've made such an effort to get to this point. Why would they stop? Um, so I, I'm very happy that we're at this point. Um, I don't know if we have any further discussion. And if not, I'd be happy to entertain a motion. <laughs> I would like to make a motion. I would like to make a motion to approve resolution 06-2324. A resolution of the Ross Valley School District Board of Trustees to sell the Deer Park property according to the findings and actions under that resolution to the Siderman Legacy Children's Fund. Oh, wait, 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 Shelley. Go back. We have two items. And one is to approve the purchase and sale agreement and adopt a sale resolution. So there are two items that you would be taking action on. <clears throat> All right. Let me restate that. Uh, I would like to make a motion to approve the purchase sale agreement. The, where is that? I right here. I'd like to make a motion to approve the purchase and sale agreement and adopt a sale resolution of the Deer Park property located at 199 Porteous Avenue in Fairfax to the Siderman Legacy Children's Fund. Second. All right. I have a motion and a second. Shelley? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Daniel? Aye. Chris? Aye. Rachel? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you all. Thanks all. Thanks all. Thank you.
All right. And on to item F2 of our agenda, public disclosure or sunshining and district acceptance of the initial contract proposal for the 2023-24 school year from the California School Employees Association, Golden Hind Chapters number 719, CSEA, to the Ross Valley School District, RVSD. Thank you. And tonight before you is, um, as Rachel mentioned, the CSEA proposal for negotiations for the 23-24 school year. And the purpose of tonight's agenda item is to sunshine their proposal to the district, as well as for the board to accept receipt of um, their uh, negotiation proposal. So what they have opened with this year is Article 5, pay and allowance, Article 6, fringe benefits, and Article 9 leaves. Specifically under pay and allowances, they're desiring a fair and equitable salary increase for all unit members. Under fringe benefits, they desire an increase in health and welfare benefits, an increase in benefit maximum for Delta Dental, and a vision plan. And then under leaves, they desire a modification to leaves. Um, it won't be until we sit at our first negotiations um, that we fully understand uh, the scope and what specifically they are asking for, but at least all tonight is the purpose is to um, sunshine the articles that they are opening and what the intent of the um, specific sections of those articles that they would like to talk about this year. And so if there are any questions... No questions, no public for comment. And so I think if um, Abel, you can. We can entertain a motion if we have no further discussion on this topic. Do you accept them? So I'll make a motion to accept the public disclosure, sunshining, district acceptance of the initial contract proposal for the 2023-24 school year from the California School Employee Association, Golden Hind Chapter Number 719 to the Ross Valley School District. I have a motion, do you have a second? I'll second it. All right, so Chris? Aye. Daniel? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Shelley? Aye. Rachel? Aye. All right, moving on. Uh, the next item is recommended ratification of the agreement with the Marin branch of the YMCA of San Francisco to provide extended learning opportunities, ELOPs, services at Ross Valley School District sites. This will be our chief business official, uh, Chris Carson. Yes. Thank you, Chris. So the ELOP program, um, extended learning opportunities program, is a program that started um, several years ago uh, with the state and it, it's taken quite an undertaking to, to get this going within the Ross Valley School District. And we are partnering with the YMCA, the local chapter here, uh, to provide the services. And an ELOP program is designed to be a uh, basically a nine hour day uh, for children and also 30 days worth of intercession. And the uh, children that qualify for the ELOP program are the children that um, are considered unduplicated pupils. So they would be our um, English language learners, students living in poverty, uh, foster youth, et cetera. And so it, it is a grade um, TK through six, which does include White Hill. We did uh, survey prior to, to starting the program, uh, the students um, and the parents, I guess, um, with White Hill and also with the um, other school sites. And what we found is that there really wasn't any interest at this time at White Hill. Uh, it's something that we're gonna continue to, to push. Uh, and what we're hoping is that by starting the process at the, um, at the elementary schools that next year, as we move forward, we, we would bring this forward again, uh, that we would then be able to offer that as we move forward at White Hill as well. Um, what it would probably require at White Hill is since there's currently no program with the YMCA, what they've done at the existing sites is just expand their, their current program. Um, but at White Hill, they probably would have to look at also offering other services. So it would, in order for it to really be beneficial, we would have to get um, parents that, that do not qualify for the, um, the program under ELOP to also wish to keep their kids there longer day. Um, 
and part of the reason I think we're we're seeing a little bit of a struggle at White Hill. Um, one, you have um, kids at that age are more likely to want to go home and go out with their friends and do different things. But also, too, just because of the distance, it means that parents, uh, because it's a nine hour day, parents generally would have to go out there to pick up their children. So I think that adds a little bit of complexity to it. So, but what is before you this evening is the approval of the contract for the current year. So, Chris, a question for staffing the why will do all of the staffing for this, correct? So they'll provide the appropriate instructors who are able to speak Spanish, I believe. And, and I would assume that they do some of that now, but I actually didn't get into that. You didn't get into no, that? No, okay. that's a great question. I, I can follow up with them, certainly, but. Yeah, just, yeah, it would be yeah. Marcy. Yeah. That absolutely makes sense. Part of the reason we didn't get the program started earlier in the year was they were short staffed. They were not right. able to hire. So I think that would be their intent is to hire folks who are bilingual. Um, but in order to keep the program going, they may not always be successful in doing that. Um, but as Chris said, he can follow up just to be sure that there's outreach when they're doing their hiring. Okay. Yeah, that would be that would be a great thing for us to stay on top of. Yeah. Um, meals are provided um, to them, I assuming, because of the free lunch program we have. They get meals. They also get uh, snacks. Okay. Yes. And can you tell me a little bit about <clears throat> this population? Um, has it grown in our in our school district? Has it has it remained um, steady? Just what what's that look like, and how are we here today? Our our traditional percentage that I've seen when looking back at our local control funding formula calculator is in the 12% range. But lately what has happened is our percentage has ticked up just a little bit. We're at 14% currently. So that, okay, that's great. So it's it's really the the need continues. The need continues. This. Okay. All right. Thank you. I just had a question I had a question about the funding mechanism. Um I noticed in the agreement around um, taking attendance. Does the money from the state for the, e I know this is under the state EL ELOP program, does the money from the state flow through us and are we then going to be required to have their attendance records that we then submit to the state and then the state pays us for those number of students and then we pay them or are we doing a contract amount for them and how's that work? So the funding for the ELOP program is going to mirror what's called the ACES program. And I don't remember what that, what the exact um, language was, but that's a state program. And also 21st century learning, which is a, a federal program, which are both after school programs. And what the requirements of that are, you have to take attendance. They don't go through our attendance system. But um, there are certain requirements that the children actually come on a routine basis. And if the children are going to be picked up early, um, there has to be some type of an agreement and a sign, a signature of the parent signing the child out. All of that is going to be uh, kept by the YMCA. This is not something that's unusual for them. They deal with this at other districts and they understand this process very well. Um, and what will happen is the auditor, when they come in, they'll take a look at that and and just ensure that we are offering. It, really, the requirement under the ELOP program is that we're, one, taking attendance, but that we offer the program. So um, it, it's going to be not calculated down to the attendance level, at least initially. Um, but And the way the funding is working is that we're paying for the additional staff for them because they have to hire additional staff to be able to house the children in essence. So then are we getting paid on a student's family's register for this program and we get so much, like, is it the same amount of money if five kids register or if 85 kids register? That's correct. Okay. It, it's the same. Okay, th th thank you, that clarifies that. My second question is, I know that with all of the funding issues at the state right now, I've seen ELOP on lists of considerations, not for necessarily canceling, but maybe delaying payments, or does our contract have some sort of clause in it that says if the state stops this program, 
we are we still on the hook for the money? How does that work? Uh, the funding has already been coming into the district. It's part of our normal uh, apportionments that we're receiving. But no, we don't have that in. However, this contract is only through the end of this year. And so I don't anticipate any changes to what the state is doing um, currently. But we, we do have the funds on hand right now as we speak to be able to fund it. So it's an annual contract. Correct. So, okay, thank you. Do you have any other questions? No? Again, there's no public for comment. I will entertain a motion if we don't have any further discussion. I'll make a motion to ratify the agreement with the Marin branch of the YMCA of San Francisco to provide extended learning opportunities, ELOP services, to the Ross Valley School District schools. Second. All right, I have a motion. I have a motion in a second. Chris? Aye. Shelley? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Daniel? Aye. Rachel? Aye. All right. Motion approved. And on to G consent action items. Is there anybody who would like to discuss any of these? We have no public for public comment. We have no comments or discussion on these. I will entertain a motion on the consent actions. Yeah. <laughs> no, I have a second. All right, Daniel, Chris, Shelley, Ryan, Rachel, I, and moving on to board business committee updates and reports from and announcements from and by trustees. Does anybody have any that they would like to mention tonight? Um, Marcy and I attended JIPA meeting, uh, was that a week ago, Marcy? Monday. And um, discussing uh, some of the issues associated with the yellow bus services. Um, we heard a lot of very helpful comments from the public. Um, a lot of the discussion was around uh, really wanting to trust that the system for the kids is working. Now, the app that they provided is something that was not part of the agreement to get Bauer, but it was something that was heavily relied on that just seemed ineffective to be able to trace the students getting on the bus, ensuring that they got on the bus. Um, you know, just hearing the stories of people with really young kids, right, who they are wanting to get on the bus. But the, the bottom line is their legal counsel spoke with us, talked about the bounding up, binding of the contracts and such, but the takeaway um, from the meeting is that the... Uh, Arrival and departure times have improved dramatically. Um, they are uh, honing the selection process. They're removing the lottery going forward. Um, they are removing one of the bus services for the charter. So that frees up some space. Um, and so going forward, it looks as if there will not be that rush to wonder if you're going to get the time slot and getting online in time. Um, and the takeaway, I think, overall is that, um, you know, we're very limited in our choices for yellow bus services. They're really just two vendors. There's no guarantee that both will do an RFP if we decide that you know, whether we're happy or not with whatever we're doing, but the takeaway is, is that we'll stick and that uh, um, that's where we're going to go going forward. I don't know if there's anything you wanted to share, Marcy, and take away from the meeting. We just think the acknowledgement of the Jeep as well as um, Marin Transit, that there has been a bumpy start. Um, there was a bumpy start when Michael's um, contract was first implemented. 
Um, and I think uh, the JIPA gave um, some direction to the Marin Transit staff to um, entertain um, or find out some answers to questions to ensure that there is consistent communication and a reliable communication to families um, sh when service may be delayed or if a bus goes out of commission or something like that um, to increase that, um, hopefully the trust that the uh, parents have for uh, their children getting to and from school. Um, do we also report out the events at schools during this time? Okay, well, since I, since I have the mic, since I'm on the air, uh, we had the most amazing fundraiser at Brookside Elementary, and I have to just commend the kids. It was kid-centric, kid-run, kid-focused, the parent club at Brookside went above and beyond motivating these children. And I'll just tell you, the, 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 the initial bogey was they said, let's raise 35000 And they said, no, oh, let's raise it to 65000 And they said, that's going to be hard to do. Well, the bottom line as of today, they've raised uh, close, close to $77,000, well in excess. Now, here's the fun part. There are classes and kids that, that, that had competitions with each other. My son, who's in the, the uh, second grade, did a lemonade stand one Saturday and raised $650 from the lemonade stand. Other lemons day, lemonade stands popped up. They raised just as much money. You had anonymous donors matching. You had it, the, the community came out and made it happen. So um, there's some delightful plans for the excess funds that um, may go to campus beautification or other things. I don't know what the parent club is doing, but to watch the community come together and raise that money in such a wonderful kid-focused way was really moving. And we were very proud. We we're very Brookside proud. So. Anyone else? Uh, yeah, I'm learning new math from uh, Miss Hunley. Thank you, Miss Hunley, for uh, teaching me new math. Um, spent uh, last, uh, maybe last week, uh, the fourth grade class went to Sacramento. So did a capital tour. Um, the Senate was in session and then went to Sutter's Fort with the fourth graders. A great experience, um, a lot of fun, a lot of excitement. Um, really cool for the students to, to see that. And thank you to all the parent volunteers and the teachers. It's not an easy day for everybody. Um, yeah, move -a -thon went well at Brookside. I'm going to release some trout tomorrow with the first graders. So hearing a lot about trout this week and last week and the week before. So I'm in it. I've been to Sacramento twice now. Yeah, I know it well. We need more people going to Sacramento. It's gonna, Daniel, say I appreciated the comment that you made at the JLAC meeting that we were the Joint Legislative Action Committee for the Marin School Boards Association, Marin County School Boards Association, where Daniel was um, challenging all of us school board members in the county to try and incorporate community members to come with us to Sacramento maybe next year and um, to be able to bring in additional community member voices for um, up to Sacramento. So I appreciated your, and it's, I think there was a lot of interest in it from other, um, and it's, I don't know if we've followed up on it, but there was also a conversation around doing a joint joint community awareness budget awareness um, presentations for uh, throughout all of Marin. So it's not up to every individual district to be doing community parent education on things that we all do, which is our budgets or LCAP and LCFF and all those kinds of things. So I haven't heard back on that, but I'm hopeful um, that that might happen. Um, so that it's again an understanding that it's not just us here, 
that we're all kind of in the same state budget funding bucket or, or not. I mean, some, some, some districts are not in the same state funding budget bucket. So, but to understand what those two different buckets are and how they work. So I don't know if you have anything else no, to say No, yeah, I've not heard anything, but I did ask Ken Lippy on that. Like, how do we get more of our Marin districts involved to have a, <laughs> another voice instead of us to say, this is our budget and this is what we have. Miller Creek, Novato, San Rafael City, Kentfield, you know, all of us have similar messages that we need to get out and, and we don't have a lot of control over what we can do. And so they seemed enthusiastic about doing something. Um, so let's keep following up. Yeah. Okay. Ryan? Okay. Um, so I, I attended a few things. I went to the Yes Board meeting. Um, they were talking about an idea to do collaborative art nights on open houses. So they're like working on that process. Um, we got a financial snapshot. They're working on their April fundraiser, like trying to get up to like the, the end goal amount. So there's going to be a big push coming in April. There's some events coming up. Um, there's uh, the Battle of the Bands, which is a big one. Uh, Gear and Gillies is doing a Tuesday night give back night every Tuesday. So that has been a big thing that it's been being pushed. Um, and let's see. They are doing call nights again. So if you haven't done any donations, I think you might get a phone call from someone very nicely just talking to you about yes and how wonderful it is. Um, and then there, there's some mention of a yes directory that they had in the past that they were maybe thinking of reviving, um, which is a good way for community involvement. Um, and then let's see, what else have we got going? I went to... Um, the DLAC meeting, and we had uh, Jesse Morales and Sue Hall, who were both with the Tamil Pius Adult School, come and speak. And they talked about some of the programs that are there that are being offered for free at the adult school. And some of them were actually even offered at Archie Williams High School, like free ESL classes in the mornings and evenings. Um, it's pretty easy. It's all free. Um, so those are great. Um, there is information on that available at our meeting. Um, and Eric Sable has more information if you wanted to get a hold of that as well. Um, we also went over just some um, Marin County Library things that they have going on. They have ESL classes, and you can find that information on their website. There's summer camp opportunities for kids in Fairfax, which is also on their website. And then we went over the summit of LPAC, and that's kind of how you – it's the English Language Proficiency Assessment for California. So it's kind of how um, – we, um, English language learners are evaluated and assessed and how they are moved through the system kind of to get them to be proficient in English. Um, and so we discussed that as well. And um, I also went to the White Hill Middle School open house. And it was like I was running through all the classrooms because I wanted to get to as many as possible. I think I probably got to more than I have in the past. Um, I saw all my child's classrooms. I had to do that first. Um, but then Ran, ran through all the classrooms and got to see all the teachers um, and just to see all the amazing stuff that was going on. They did such such an amazing job of presenting all the schoolwork that has been done in all the various classrooms from the history, from art. Not Art was just blew me away. But um, English, history, science, there were very cool things on display in all of the classrooms that I went to. So I just wanted to say thank you to the teachers for doing that. And then there were food trucks so the parent club just went above and beyond. It was like a party in the quad. It was so much fun just walking around. There's like live music from the students. Um, they were, it was very fun. Um, and yeah, it was just, it was a great scene. So it was, it was a good experience. Anyways, that's all I've got. Um, so unless we have anything else, moving on to approval of the regular meeting minutes for March 6, 2024. I'll entertain a motion unless anyone has any changes. Uh, no changes. I'll approve of uh, the regular meeting minutes from March 6, 2024. All right. I have a motion to approve. Do we have a second? I'll second it. All right. So, Chris? Aye. Daniel? Aye. Shelley? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Rachel? Aye. All right. And on to superintendent and cabinet reports updates. All right. Thank you very much. And we'll start with Eric Sable, Director of Student Services. Thank you. Um, uh, Rachel did a great job talking about
work that our teachers and staff are doing to support students in our district. Um, and also to, you know, something that we're just going to continue working on is really um, trying to get um, more participation and get more folks, uh, you know, in in the meeting. At the same time, we do send out all the resources to, to everybody, um, including the recording from uh, the Zoom. So um, excited for continued work there. And um, also, too, last week we um, did a, a Zoom meeting for our fifth grade parents um, to launch puberty education um, uh, for their students uh, across all our four schools. And our district nurse, Jen Hammerski, is going to be um, giving four lessons. Um, so she'll kind of set up shop at a, uh, each site, um, one per week. And um, and so, you know, we just kind of ran through uh, what that program is. And then as we've had for many years that uh, we have a, um, a, a health educator um, consultant named Steve Gardner, um, who uh, previously before retiring worked in Oakland schools. And he came and kind of gave um, kind of a big uh, overview of the 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 aims and, and purpose of puberty education. Um, and so he's he's a wonderful partner to have. And we had a just it was a great event. And again, also shared out the resources to all the families um, for uh, especially for those that weren't able to be there. Um, in other news, um, with uh, our multilingual learners, we've uh, got the LPAC testing going, as Rachel talked about. Um, so that's happening across our district. And that happens for all our students identified as English language learners um, until such time as they're able to be reclassified based on um, achieving um, a proficiency vis-a-vis um, uh, -vis the LPAC as a metric and also too from their teacher input and from the parent input as well. Um, so that's a, a very organic ongoing process. And um, last thing too is in the world of special education, uh, springtime means transitions. So we're um, going all over the county uh, just today. Um, uh, Ms. Sarah Hom and I were um, at multiple early intervention sites up in Terra Linda um, to observe students um, to see about appropriate uh, programming for them for TK or kindergarten. Um, and uh, we're also doing the same thing um, with assessment requests uh, for students that may be at independent schools, private schools, other kinds of settings. And then of course, uh, for our fifth to sixth grade, uh, that's a big process. And, uh, and obviously for our eighth graders matriculating to high school. So um, the staff is, um, it, it really, it, they're working in kind of parallel fashion to serve their students right now, but also to, to um, be working to set them up for next year so it's a tremendous effort um, on their behalf takes teamwork um, between us uh, between Marin County Office of Ed and their programs and also to our friends across the street in TAM district and I think that's it for now thank you can I ask but, a question yep, about the puberty is fifth what? grade I'm yeah. so, I'm so, okay is the fifth grade too late like, is there any thought about moving that up to fourth grade? You know, it's interesting is um, uh, so uh, I think that, you know, they're, they're in, in like out in the ether. There are conversations about how, you know, we could possibly start, um, uh, you know, some of those topics potentially in, in fourth grade. Um, there's no uh, reason um, that, you know, we have to wait for, you know, fifth grade to, to start to to address some of those issues. So, um, so yes, yeah, stay tuned um, uh, for my next report a year from now, and we'll discuss how it went from fourth grade potentially. Thank you, good question. Thank you, Eric. Um, direct, or sorry, Assistant Superintendent of Ed Services, Julia Wolcott. Yeah, this has been a, a busy and bustling room this week. Um, on Monday, our White Hill Math Department had a release day, so six teachers and, and both um, of our co-principals were able to join for various parts of the day. And we're looking at curriculum. Currently, the teachers are using um, a program called Illustrative Mathematics, but they're using it through a free version, which is an open source platform called OpenUp. 
Um, but what we're finding is that there's a, another platform that's a that's a, a paid version that just has a lot more to offer and a lot more that our teachers are looking for. Um, and so we're very likely going to be piloting that program next year. Um, so the it's Imagine Math's version of illustrative mathematics. Um, it also connects to, they use as kind of a supplement, a program from Desmos, which um, Desmos kind of started as an online calculator. Um, but it has really wonderful, um, thoughtful concept building ways to move kids through constructing knowledge around mathematics. Um, and they use a lot of the same curriculum as that open up resource. So it's all kind of connected and we're very excited about it, especially because I just found out that both the pilot and the professional development is free. So um, it looks like it's going to be an easy process and our teachers are really excited about it. And then the other part of the day, um, there was a lot of just conversation about the work they've been doing to differentiate instruction for their students this year and what's been working and, and what they've been trying. They've been um, piloting different kind of ways of doing that and then observing one another in the classroom and learning from each other and then debriefing. So that's been terrific. And then Tuesday, we had the sixth of our series of six days on ethnic studies, which has just been an amazing, amazing endeavor, working with Jason Muniz from the UC Berkeley History Social Science Project. Um, and the, the teachers were saying they feel like they've taken a college class. And, and that's really how it's been. And I've been in that room for each one of these trainings. Like, I don't leave the room because I don't want to miss anything. It's just been incredible. Um, and all along the way, they, the training takes place in the morning. And then in the afternoon, they're working on their units. So each of our grade levels, first through eighth grade, now have um, drafted a unit of study. Um, taking their history, social science curriculum and really bringing in those ethnic studies components. And um, our Brookside teachers that are part of the project are planning to be the ones to do the spotlight on Brookside. So they're going to give you a little taste of all of that. I think that happens May 1st, something like that. And then today we had um, quite a day with our 17 English language arts pilot teachers. This is our second release day working together and diving into, we've been looking at six programs. Um, the first day that we had, we spent most of the time or at least half the day developing our lens um, and using all the knowledge that we've gotten from our work with um, the trainer Jessica Hammond from Glean Education and, and all of the articles that we've been reading um, and also the conversations that we've been having about our core beliefs around English language arts instruction. And we kind of created this evaluation lens and now they've been using that lens to look at the programs. There are no clear answers. Right now out of the six, we've eliminated one. Um, and we're just going to keep digging deeper. I think we're going to, um, at our next release day, hear from the reps um, and see if we can get some of our questions answered. It's really interesting looking at the programs because some have, um, the strengths of the programs are very different. So one program might have kind of an extraordinary foundational um, phonics and phonemic awareness for the younger grades, but the upper grades might feel like it's not quite engaging in the way that they want it to be. Um, and then one of our deal breakers as a group is um, cultural responsiveness and really diverse representation. And that frankly is lacking in some of the programs. And so that's been really tricky, a program that is very, very strong in terms of reading instruction and alignment with science of reading, but that just doesn't feel like every child is going to see themselves in that program, which is disappointing actually. Um, but really um, thoughtful and reflective and incredible work on the part of our teachers. And then just one other thing, very excited tomorrow evening, Dr. Lori Watson is going to be um, doing a parent education evening at Manor School from 5.30 to 7.30. We have, I think, 60 teachers signed up. Um, this is the first of a series. This year we're going to have, have two 
evenings and the next year we'll launch with two more. Um, this one I think is focused on how, how to talk about race. And um, she's also working with our White Hill students, um, a student group there. They, it's called SLAM, which is student-led, I get this wrong every time, anti-racism anti movement. Um, but it's a group of kids really looking at race and racism and their school and belonging and inclusion and, and working with, with her. And all of that is funded through our anti-bias grant that we received from the state. So it's terrific to be able to do this um, and have the funds to do it. Julia, what's the, um, it's great that that many teachers are showing up. How many are parents showing up? For the no, those are parents. Those are six parents. Some, some teachers are coming, oh, okay. but so the 60 parents, people are teachers. parents so and pretty evenly spread throughout all of our oh, five great. schools. That's yeah. Great. Yeah. So Wonderful. we've got a good crowd. Thank you. And Chris Carson. Nothing more tonight. Um, I'll highlight uh, two elements uh, or um, recent updates. Uh, thank you, uh, Rachel and Chris, for talking about JIPA and the YES board meeting. Um, you covered those. And I want to say with Roundtable, I am very pleased to announce that we have final approval of our new updated Roundtable agreement. And it has been over a year and a half um, in the making. Um, our focus was to ensure that not only did we have parity across all of our schools in terms of whichever school any of our children attend, that they will have the same opportunities um, and access. And so that required utilizing an equity lens and really taking a look at practices and, um, and fundraising and spending um, with that. And I want to highlight especially Shelley Hamilton, who led um, a subcommittee. So we had our parent uh, leaders, as well as um, representatives of our administrative team, who participated in subcommittee work. And Shelley, thank you so much for leading the beginning of that. And then to Libby Landels Cobb, uh, one of the co-presidents for the Brookside Parent Club, um, took it from the work that had started and led us to our um, home run at the end. So um, this was really a uh, parent-led endeavor. And the focus that we want to spend time in our roundtable meetings is not to talk about funding and so on per se. We want to focus on fundraising efforts, how to maximize those. And I want to say one of the collaborative efforts, and thank you, Chris, tonight for talking about Brookside's Move-A-Thon. Um, as Libby talked about in our roundtable agreement, sorry, roundtable meeting, um, when we finished and adopted or approved our roundtable agreement, we were able to move on to these, some of these other topics. And what Libby talked about is having had at least through others of our meetings and that collaboration of hearing from each of the school sites, Brookside's Parent Club did take the best of what they heard, what they learned from each of the schools. And so we also believe that these are replicable across all of the sites. And so we really want to get into the crowdsourcing, crowd sharing of ideas and um, and also, uh, let me back up, the YES Foundation um, is a huge part also of um, this, and Chelsea Donovan, executive or director for the YES Foundation, was part of the subcommittee work as well. Um, and so very proud of the work and for our parent leaders to stick with it through this year and a half process, and I'm very pleased um, with the outcome. One of the goals that we had with the revisions to the roundtable agreement are that no matter who picks it up, it will be understandable so that it won't rely on the um, institutional memory of folks who came before um, in positions because these volunteer positions do change over at school sites. And so I'm very pleased with that. Looking forward to our future meetings where we will now be able to focus. And as um, Rachel talked about, uh, the yes, or part of what we talked about at the roundtable meeting was reinstating a directory. And we're very happy that the YES Foundation has agreed to take the lead in that. So we are taking a look at our back to school packet where we specifically 
ask parents for per permission related to directory information so that families are very clear um, what information might go in a directory that they can have permission. And that would be for use for such things for birthday parties and so that kids can socialize with their peers cross school population. For those of us who have been around for a while, we all remember the old yes directory is a paper printed copy. This one will be digital. And so um, we're looking forward to have that go forward. And um, mentioning the White Hill open house, I too went, I went through every classroom and it was an amazing showcase, an amazing energy at the school site. But the showcase that came in the forms of student work samples, um, uh, scavenger hunts, slideshows, um, demonstrations, um, the ability as a person walking through that I could actually play with uh, some of the uh, creations that the um, teachers led for the students to be able to do. It was an amazing night. The energy was really high and just proud of the accomplishments of our White Hill teachers, faculty, staff, administration, and our students. And also, I'm looking forward to the next upcoming open houses, because it is the season to get to all the schools and looking forward to that. And I think with that, we'll um, rest for the evening. All right, well, thank you. And so let's see where we're superintendent updates. All right, so we are, let's see, it's J, continuation of closed session, which we did not get to all of our items. So we will recess to a continuation of closed session at 922. All right, it is 1037 and we are reconvening out of closed session. We had a motion to continue our meeting past 1030 with a three to two vote. Um, so it is 1037 now. Our report out from our continuation of closed session is that we um, approved, hold on, let me get up there. We approved one item, we took action on one item, the conference with legal counsel anticipated litigation, significant exposure to litigation pursuant to government code 54956.9 subdivision D2 or three, special education program dispute one case uh, student SSID number 4309923216. We, 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 we approved ap staff recommendation. We approved the staff recommendation on that settlement agreement. And no action was taken on the other two items that were in our closed session tonight. And so, um, Future board topics, meeting to brief, any comments, anybody? No, seeing none, and we will adjourn the meeting at 10.38 p.m.